for the Romans, for the Greeks, for the Celts, before the great Proto-Indo-European migration and before the Bronze Age, there were Basques. Tucked in a little mountainous region between modern-day Spain and France, the Basques had begun to develop their own culture, language, and unique religion at the same time that the wheel was being invented. So small in number, Basques have had a disproportionate impact on society and history. Kaisho, ni walker nice. Arata Leon Gustioi. Good evening, everybody. My name is Walker Devine. I'm part Basque on my father's side, and through this, have sought to make more meaningful connections and explore my history and culture and that of my people. I grew up hearing stories about the Basques, about our past, about our history, actions, legends, and it was an important force throughout my childhood. My first Basque ancestor is Duke Diego de Arechavala, who was born sometime in the early 1500s in a town called Arechavaleta in the Basque country. And although I was fascinated that my most recent ancestor, Duke Manuel de Arechavala, who was born in the Basque country as well, was of noble blood or some sort of interesting family pedigree, what really fascinated me about the Basques is their uniqueness as a people and the values that they hold dear. Now, language is the most definitive and unique factor about Basques. And to understand this uniqueness, first we need to understand where other European languages come from. Now this map shows the migration of a language called Proto-Indo-European, which was born in the Pontic Steppe sometime around 6,000 years before Christ, and arrived to the Iberian Peninsula in roughly 2500 BC. But at the time of its arrival, Basque was already flourishing, suggesting that it was already a regional language, highly ingrained into the society, a process that can take hundreds or up to thousands of years. Throughout history, as more and more people, the Romans and the Celt-Iberians, further invaded Eastern, sorry, Western Europe and Iberia, they brought with them languages of Indo-European origin as well, in the form of Latin and Celtic. But the Basques stayed strong. They did not assimilate to Proto-Indo-European based languages. They maintained their uniqueness, even against external pressure. Coming up a little faint, but so, how do we know that Basque isn't from Proto-Indo-European? A common way to identify languages of Indo-European origin is using the two words for God and Father, basic words in any language, some of the first that are invented, if you will. And in languages of Indo-European origin, there are always some cognate or derivative of Dios and Feter the Proto-Indo-European sky deity, or deity, and coincidentally, the words for God and Father. Now, these similarities can be seen across the globe in all sorts of languages, like Avestan, which is a kind of proto-Farsi, if you will, where it takes the form of Choda and Pitar, in the form of Hindi, where it takes the form of Goda and Father, in the form of Spanish, as Dios and Per, in the, and padre, in the form of Latin, as Deus and Pater, in the form of ancient Greek, in the form of Zeus and Pater. But Basque has none of these similarities. For example, the Basque word for God is Heinkoa, which be, uh, bears no resemblance or any form of evolution from that kind of substrata of languages. And the Basque word for Father is Aita, which again, there's no resemblance. Slide's out of order. Now, even with burgeoning empires and new cultures approaching the Basques, they remained strong. And not only did they fight a linguistic battle to preserve their identity, but also real wars. In an almost Forrest Gump-like manner, 
Basques have managed to weave their way in and out of history's conflicts. The earliest record of this is that of a Greek philosopher who documented that the Basques fought on the Peloponnese in the fourth century BC. Following that, word spread across the Mediterranean to the Carthaginians, who in the third century BC explored Iberia all the way up until the Basque country. But instead of attempting to conquer or subdue the Basques, they hired them as an elite high-level mercenary fighting force in an attempt to combat a burgeoning Roman Republic. The Basques fought with Hamilcar in Sicily. They rode elephants across the Alps in tandem with Hannibal on his way to sack Rome. And at the end of the conflict, they saw Carthage plundered and burned almost 100 years later. But in a cruel twist of fate for the Carthaginians, the Romans would not punish the Basques for fighting against them and instead learned from their Carthaginian predecessors. Instead of attempting to subdue the Basques, instead they granted them autonomy for a period that lasted over five centuries and saw a great expansion of Basque territory and its linguistic region. However, this would come to an abrupt halt in 415 when the Visigoths, a Germanic tribe, would invade Iberia. Over the course of the next 300 years, the Visigoths would mount 20 armed incursions into the Basque country, using no less than 200,000 soldiers at any one point. But the Basques remained an insurmountable obstacle. They would not move. So profound was the effect of the Basques on their Visigothic counterparts that on the chronicles written about Basque, or sorry, the Visigothic kings' lives, it was customary to end these books with a Latin phrase of two simple words, domuit vasconis, we must control the Basques. Further on in history, as new empires invaded the Basque country, the Umayyads, they consistently found themselves trying to take the capital of Irunya, or modern day Pamplona, but were forcibly driven back time and time again, as the Basques would not surrender. The same applied for Charlemagne, who faced his only defeat in history at Roncesvalles in the Basque country at a mountain pass. The Basques would not be controlled. And even later on, as more and more cultures conformed to specific empires and regions adopting similar languages, the Basques would not assimilate. They would remain unique. Into the Middle Ages, the Basques, under new protection from these kingdoms, pioneered new technologies, practices, industry. One such industry is whaling. The Basques were the first people in Europe and arguably the world to practice commercial whaling. With receipts from French monasteries dating back to the early seventh century, detailing Basque whalers bringing oil and other baleen-based supplies to them. But it's assumed that the practice started far earlier, earlier than that. The Basques were the first to salt cod using it for long expeditions and voyages into the Bay of Biscay and further north, where they encountered Vikings and traded it with them for other products, fueling expeditions into the New World with this new food-based technology. These expeditions would last from the 7th century all the way through the 16th century, and were sometimes led by Basques themselves. One such man, Ion Esteban Elcano, born in the town of Guetaria on the Basque coast, was a fisherman and talented sailor who acted as the first mate of Magellan's crew and eventual captain of Magellan's voyage. And after his untimely death in the Pacific, Ion Esteban Elcano was officially the first man to circumnavigate the globe. The Basques did not only see the beginning of the age of colonialism and the Reconquista, but also its end, as the Spanish witch trials formally ended at Suguramurdi in the Basque country. However, the after effects of the Reconquista and the bias placed upon the enigmatic, unique Basques and their strange language, culture, territory, would have them grouped in with other minority groups, Jews, Muslims, traveler communities, and have a severe bias placed upon them that would last another 400 years, labeling them as the cause of much strife and disorder in Spain. This would culminate in 1936 when Generalissimo Francisco Franco bombed 
the historic Basque capital of Guernica. The seat of Basque power for over 2,000 years and the historic site where leaders of the ancient Basque kingdom of Biscay, or Biscaya, would make their laws and establish traditions. However, the Basques would fight on and would find beauty out of destruction. The violence and terror of this attack was captured and immortalized in Pablo Picasso's famous painting, the Guernica of the same name. And Basques would not surrender. They would fight on, establishing secret schools to teach the now outlawed Basque and preserve their culture for the next 50 years under Franco's regime. But just like the Guernica Arbola, the thousand-year-old oak that grew in Guernica, the symbol of the Basque country and of my house, the Basques re-sprouted. Basques have never been stronger. There are over a million native speakers of Basque in the Basque country now, twice more than at any other point in history. The Basque country itself has recovered, establishing itself as an economic powerhouse of Spain and a global center of the arts. But through it all, Basques have not held on to their uniqueness or their language or their history or the violence and oppression and genocide that they faced. They've held on to their values, values that we can all possess, courage, bravery, honesty, an unwavering perseverance and a steadfast determination to look forward into the future and to create a better one. And my hope is that in that small way, we can all try to be a little bit more Basque. But here's my charge for you. Basques aren't the only unique culture in the world. Everybody has their own history, dating back thousands of years. Everybody has their own past, present, and future. So I ask of you this. Try to learn more about yourself, where you come from. Maybe you can understand the values that are important to your culture as well. Call your grandma. Call her, please. Even if it's on the weekend, take the time. Ask her, where does she come from? What customs did she grow up with? I've done it myself. And in this way, maybe everybody can become a little bit more connected with themselves and find out who they truly are. Esquerigasco, etagur, thank you.